Good morning. So I am uh, going to start. Oh, okay. Right. Are we on? The song, huh? Okay, so let me start with the slides. Okay, so this is uh, this apologetics, being certain of your Christian faith. And we explored last week that apologetics lets us examine the truth of the Christian faith to know and be sure of it. Uh, that's the first thing. We can know the truth of the Christian faith. And then we can, second one, be convinced that it is God's absolute truth. And being God's absolute truth, we can therefore share it, learn to explain it, and also to defend it, but not to argue, of course. And the third thing is to witness to it with certainty and conviction. So we can share pe with people um, the message of salvation and talking about uh, being sure of what we believe. And fourth is apologetics lets us live out our faith in the midst of the endless and confusing truths in the world. There are so many people teaching all kinds of truths. And so it becomes one, Christianity becomes one out of many options. Yeah, so that becomes very confusing because many people are very convincing. So we find that in the midst of a world which, which claims that all faiths and religions are the same, and it doesn't matter what you believe, apologetics helps us to determine what's the absolute truth of God. And then we make sense of God's truth in order to fulfill the meaning and purpose of life as God intends for us. Okay, so this is a, this picture I put here is just an illustration. It's full of many things, very distracting and nothing stands out, right? So the truth of God is somehow amongst everything here uh, and you know, it doesn't really seem to stand out until we are able to look deeper into the mess of so-called truths. Okay, so an example of the many truths that people, uh, of the many things that people claim as truth. Huh? Uh, some people will tell you, all religions are the same. So it doesn't matter which one you believe. They're all good. You know, because they all teach us to do good. So is this true? You might have heard this from people saying, okay, so let's take a quick look at this issue today, whether all religions are the same and Christianity or faith in God, faith in Jesus is also the same as all these other religions. Well, the Bible shows that this claim does not apply to the living God, to the creator God. The Bible says there's only one God and creator who is also our savior. Let's take a look at Isaiah 43, verses 10 and 11. If somebody can turn there and help us to read that. Another person in advance can turn to Exodus chapter 20, and later on, read for us from verse 3 to 6. Isaiah 43, verses 10 to 11. I read Isaiah 43, verses 10 to 11. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I even, I am the Lord, and apart from me, there's no saviour. Thank you, Jack. Okay, if you read verse 12, it also says, I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I am not some foreign God among you. 
you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. So Isaiah 43 verses 10 to 11 tells us that the creator God is also our savior. So there's no other God. Yeah. And God's commandments say that we are to have no other gods and we are not to worship idols. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 to 6, please. Whoever has found it. Exodus uh, 23, 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Thank you. All right, so in this reference, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20, we see that God says, no other gods and no images. We are not to bow them, bow down to them or worship them. God says we are to worship him alone. So you can see this, uh, this, uh, this saying people have that all religions are the same. It doesn't matter which one you believe because they are all good and they teach us to do good. Does not apply to the creator God. Okay, so you can see, as I showed in this picture, amidst a mess of so many things, so many truths, in further commas, yeah, we have to be able to examine carefully and see the truth of God deeper than what looks on the surface. So we have seen this picture before anybody uh, was able to make out what it says. Let me continue first with uh, Jesus taught. Jesus teaching, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, verse 6. So once again, another reference in the Bible shows us there's only one truth. That is Jesus, and he alone gives us the way and the life through the Father. Right, and then one more reference, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Peter confirmed by saying, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Okay, so we have got explored these references in the Bible, and like mentioned last week. Our position for uh, the truth of this, of this life and this world stands on the Bible. So we are getting words from the Bible to respond to all the beliefs and all the claims that people make. So maybe there's a thousand and one or two thousand and two <laughs> claims that people make. But the Bible makes it very clear, not all religions are the same. Okay, they all teach us to go do good. That's what people say. But we will see from the Bible that doing good alone is not enough. Because God says that all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Can somebody turn to Isaiah 64 verse 6, please? And read that for us. Isaiah 64 verse 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Thank you, Kelvin. Right, so this reference says that all our righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. So if all religions teach us the same thing and teach us to do good. The thing that the Bible says is that where God is concerned, all the good that we do, all our righteousness is like dirty pieces of cloth. And they are not just ordinary good quality cloth, they are rags before God. 
So you see, all religions, no use. If they teach us to do good, it's not enough. Okay, the key word is not enough. So the Bible shows that all other religions may be the same, but not faith in Christ. So no matter how good we are, we cannot do enough good to earn or deserve salvation to enter God's heavenly kingdom. All right, so this is the Bible's response. So has anybody else looked at this picture during the week to find out the message it says? Anybody managed to find? Yeah, this one, you this one you have to have a special way of looking at it. Okay, um, maybe we give it another try this week. I have put the two dots here, okay? The two blue, blue dots here. Uh, what you do is you stare at the center between the two dots. And when you stare correctly, uh, the two dots will become three dots. Okay, it, it doesn't, the, a third dot is, appears there, but it is not really there. It's because of the way you're staring. Okay, um, maybe a little bit more guidance to see if it's helpful. When you stare, don't just look at that center in your normal way, okay? You have to stare like in a daze. You know, sometimes we're dreamy. Sometimes we're dreamy. Uh, no, the word's not correct, Jacqueline. Not correct. Okay, uh, wrong guess. I saw something like that. Uh, we're not supposed to guess this. You see, this picture yeah, I is saw, supposed I saw. Yeah, I saw two words, so it's wrong words, okay. This, this picture is not supposed to, for, to be for us to make out the two words that we think, okay? Um, like I said, there's on the surface, there's so many truths, so many things that seem to be grabbing our attention. But the truth of God, okay, is deeper inside. So we have to look deeper into this picture and... As I was saying, how to look deeper is to stare. Now, you know, sometimes you're kind of like in a daze, you stare into the air, and when you stare into the air, you're not really looking at something because your mind is thinking, okay? Then this is the way to look at this picture. Okay, so you stare somewhere here in between the two blue dots where my cursor is, just stare there, like you are in the days, just stare there until, oh, I've, I've got the three dots appear in front of my eyes now. And then I look down into the picture and there I focus, I can see the two words and a symbol. Okay, I'm gonna keep quiet for you to focus. Okay, focus like you are in a daze, huh? in between the two blue dots. Like you're blur, you just focus there in a dreamy state. And as you focus the picture, everything will be there, but you will see two words pop up. Like the quality of the picture will be like a mirror. Okay, the whole picture now will become a mirror like kind of reflection, kind of clarity, and then you will see the two words and a symbol. Okay, Leland got it. Well done. Did you all see? Still cannot? Okay, so, so now I've got two people who can see it now. Huh? Jacob can see and Leland can see. So the rest of you, when you get the, get this, uh, this picture later on, you can take your time to look at the two words, look for the two words and an arrow. Liling, did you see an Oh, sorry, I just told you the symbol. Okay, so that's the three things you should be able to see in this picture. All right, so I'm using this picture as an illustration or an object lesson that in the midst in, of this world, ah, okay, Liling has got arrow pointing right. 
Okay, so in the midst of all the things that people claim to be truth, so the whole world is full of truth that people claim. And Christianity is, or the faith in God is buried right in the midst of so many truths. Yeah, and it's only when we begin to spend time staring, examining, especially the truth of God that we see deeper beyond the surface and we see one way, only one way, and the arrow pointing us in the direction. Okay, so that is the word of God and through apologetics, we can actually therefore uh, explore to find that one way truth pointing us in God's direction. So let's move on. We know that faith in God, last week we have already explored, is intelligent and rational, and it's also historical and factual, right? It's intelligent and rational because God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, yeah? So loving God with our mind means we have to love God intelligently, and rationally. It's faith in Christ is historical and factual because there are facts just like World War I and World War II. The history records, documents to show that they happened. So similarly, Christ is also a reality, right? The truth of Christ is also historical and factual. Faith in Christ is also objective and based on principles of truth. Okay, that's it for today, that picture. So let's go on. If the Christian faith is such an intelligent, rational, historical and factual faith, then why do many people reject it? You see, in Christ's time as well as today, people reject out of ignorance. That's one reason. Uh, example, John 7, 40 to 43. Can somebody turn there, please? John 7, 40 to 43. John 7, 40 to 43, on hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said he is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Thank you, Kelvin. All right, so this passage itself you see with Jesus in their midst there were already people who were not even sure about the truth about Christ yeah they are debating whether Christ comes from Galilee and Bethlehem and so on right so they know a little bit but basically they are ignorant so some people re resist faith in God, faith in Christ, because they are ignorant of the complete facts about Christ. They only know partial truth. And in their partial truth, they either believe the wrong thing or they reject Christ. So that's one reason people reject him that is out of ignorance. Another one is pride and of fear. Uh, John chapter 12, uh, somebody, please, 42 to 43. John chapter 12, verses, what, verse 42 to 43. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. 
But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Thank you, Jack. All right, so we will see that uh, there are people who are fearful. They are fearful of coming to Christ because of other people. They are fearful in coming to Christ because uh, they think that they will suffer. They are fearful to give up certain things. They are fearful of what people may say. So may come with an element of pride. So this group of people reject Christ because they want to be approved by men. Uh, and that kept them from confessing Jesus as the Christ. Another one is uh, the moral problem, moral problem with people. Uh, John chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. verse 19 and the judgment is based on this fact God's light came into the world but people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed thank you Meg okay so you see that this is another reason some people prefer to stay in the darkness instead of light, because their deeds are evil in God's eyes. And so they reject the evidence about faith in Christ because it would mean having to change their lifestyle. And the basic thing is they refuse to change. And today, many people making efforts to justify their ungodly lifestyle or refusal to change, they accept only evidence which supports theories that allow them to continue their lifestyle. Another one is that they reject any evidence which may support a doctrine, a teaching that would condemn their behavior and require a change. So we explore just very briefly today, three reasons why people reject uh, Jesus, the Christian faith even though it is intelligent, rational, factual, and true enough to be historically accurate and proven to be true, right? So ignorance, some people don't know the truth correctly. So they believe all sorts of things and whether partly correct or totally wrong, they reject Christ. Of course, there may be some people who actually know a lot, but still reject. That's because of fear or pride. They are afraid of what other people may say. They are afraid of people's opinions. And then there's the moral problem of not wanting to change because they want to cling on to things that God would not want them to in their life. Okay, so what it boils down to is this. People reject Christ, not so much a problem of the mind, not so much a problem of really whether it makes sense, but the will. Not so much I can't, but I won't. And there is actually enough evidence when we uh, look, at, look honestly and openly at the faith to convince the honest and sincere seeker. But number three, there's not enough evidence to force a person against his or her will when he or she is determined to reject it. So these are the realities. And I've shown a picture here. Uh, the point of this picture is to, as an illustration that some people are determined to believe or just create their own version of truth. And actually it's an impossible truth where God is concerned. They create their own version of truth to follow instead of following God's truth. 
Now, if you look at this picture, on the surface, it looks good. It looks okay, right? Just like some people, they, they believe what they believe on the surface, it looks okay. But if you examine it closely, you'll find that something is wrong with this picture. Take a good look. Can you see what's wrong with this picture? Anybody can see? Yeah, sometimes it looks just like one and sometimes it's two side by side. The wooden thing. Uh-huh. So what what is wrong with this picture now? Seems like an optical illusion, you know. Uh -huh. So what is the illusion? The illusion is sometimes you see one, but it can be two, or it can be actually two, but you see as one. Mm, that will be a, need a bit of explanation because... Yeah, because uh, from the picture, it looks like the shorter plank is on top of the longer plank of wood. But then again, when you look, it can be like side by side. Yes, thank you. On one end, on the left end, you see that the two pieces of wood, they seem to be one on top of the other. But as you move along to the other side, eh, how come it's not one on top of the other? It's actually side by side. That's right. Thank you, Mimi. So what does, what is, uh, does it make sense? Does it make sense? Is it possible in real life? In real life, this, this structure would be totally impossible. Yeah, but in this picture, it looks very good. It looks like everything is all right. But in actual fact, you cannot have you cannot have one part one end where the two pieces are actually one on top of the other then as you taper to the other end suddenly they are side by side instead of one on top of the other right so it takes a closer examination of this object for us to realize that this is not possible so in the point of this object lesson is that some people, they are just determined to believe certain things, okay? Believe certain things. So like the two, the two, two planks or whatever you know, call them, they look good. They seem to make sense, make a picture. But when you examine them closely, it's just not right. That is the truth of that's the version of truth that people make up or people believe. It's actually not consistent. And they would rather have that and follow God's truth. Okay, and what one more thing that confuses us is actually the presence of the hand. Correct? It looks like the hand is holding on to these two, two blocks. Right? And yet these two blocks are impossible. So how can a hand be holding on to these two blocks when the picture that the two blocks together makes is actually impossible? Right? Okay. So like last week, we had a picture, if you remember, of the girl's dress and she, her legs seem to have disappeared. Yeah, we have to make sense of it and realize the truth. So here is another thing where people can come up with some kind of truth for themselves, but actually it is not right as far as the truths of God are measured with this kind of truth. Okay, so let's move on now to looking at the Bible. 
the divine origin, the Bible makes a bold, absolute claim that it alone, just the Bible it alone, is the word that God revealed to men. So the Bible makes this absolute claim. Yeah, and it's a very daring claim. And though it was written by men, the ultimate author is God Almighty. So when we say that, people say, ah, yeah, that's not true, leh, because your Bible is also written by people. You know, so the church or Christians did not make this claim, did not make up this claim, did not invent this claim. It is the Bible itself that makes this claim for itself. Okay, now the Bible claims to be God's revelation to man about himself. Starts off with, in the beginning, God created. So it reveals God to be the creator. Yeah, God's revelation to men and tells us about the world we live in that was, was created. Tells us about men, ourselves, and tells us about sin. It also goes on to talk about our relationship to the creator God, particularly through Jesus Christ. And very importantly, the Bible tells us about God's planned eternal destiny for us. So the Bible makes this claim to be God's revelation to men about these things. Now, this is Christianity teaching the truth about life and man. How did man get here? What is the purpose of life? What is life meant to be about? And other significant questions of life that we ask in the course of our time. The truth is recorded in the Bible. And the Bible gives us the basis of where man comes from, that God made us and he made us in his image, where he is going, where is our final destination beyond our short life on earth. And the Bible provides the foundation for man's faith and living. The Bible tells us how, what and how we are to believe and how we are to live life because of that. Because we are people created by God for a significant and eternal purpose. So the Bible tells us we are meant to exist forever. Not in limbo, not in death, and not purpose, uh, purposeless. Okay, so the Bible provides all these uh, truths for us. And because it makes such significant and bold claims as being the word of the creator God about man's life and eternal destiny, it must prove itself. It must prove itself that it is really the divine word of God. And it must pass countless tests. All right, but we are going to explore not all the countless tests for now. We're just going to look at the a few of the more basic ones, like the message of the Bible. What does it say? Which we have just kind of briefly mentioned here, right? And then it's truth. It's what the Bible says true. Okay, and we are also going to, in the course of the series, um, going to explore how we know it is true. Here's one more important thing for us to know about whether it's true. It's whether it's accurately transmitted. You know, the first copy of the Bible that God gave to us, have people changed what the Bible said since it was first written in that very first copy until today? Okay, that's been a period of a few thousand years from the time the original copy was given to us by God, written by man, until today, along the way have people changed the teachings and the words in the Bible. That's very important because if people have changed it, that means it no longer remains true to its original content and message. 
Okay, so the accurate transmission from the very first time God produced the first copy through man and its relevance to us even today and to future generations. So these are some of the very basic and important tests that the examination of the Bible must be able to uh, give us satisfactory, uh, not, not kind of like uh, satisfactory in the sense of being open and honest about it, not that we want to force the Bible to say exactly what we want it to say. Okay, so we will explore the writer Bible, uh, Bible writers claimed repeatedly that they were transmitting God's very word infallible and authoritative. Infallible means it's totally right. It's not wrong. Authoritative, it comes from God himself. And this is a huge claim that any writer can make. But that is exactly what the writers of the scriptures claimed. For example, 1 Peter 1.25, the word of the Lord says that, stands forever. So it is supposed to be relevant forever until the end of this world. And that's a long time. We don't even know when the world is going to end. And 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. Sorry, not supposed to have the apostrophe S. All scripture is God-breathed. That means it comes from God himself and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Okay, so Apostle Peter confirms that the authors of the Bible were directed by the inspiration and power of God's Holy Spirit. Peter says that so in 2 Peter Chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. Maybe somebody can read it for us. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Mac. Okay, so you see that no prophecy of scripture came about because the prophet interpreted it himself. Yeah, and the reason is prophecy, the origin of prophecy is not in the will of men. That means it is not human being who prophesied, but it is the people speaking from God. God is the source behind their prophecy behind the words they say, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that is the idea of all scripture is God breathed. Okay, that is to say it's carried along by the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit put the words in the person's mind or the person's mouth. Okay, and that is how over 2,000 times in the Old Testament alone, there are clauses such as the word of the Lord came to. That means God said something to somebody or God said very direct. So let's explore this question that must be burning in your mind as we, dis as we said all these things. How can we understand that the Bible can be written by human hands? and yet be the revealed word of God. Yeah, we've said so much about what the Bible says. Now, let's look at this real issue. God is the originator of these words, but how can it be written by human hands? So, I give an illustration by looking at this question uh, in this way. How can God be the author of the Bible since it is written by human hands? Now, the same question can be answered using the application to many things in this world. For example, here is a Taj Mahal, right? It's a very majestic, beautiful structure. And we say that Shah Jahan built this Taj Mahal for his wife. But then the thing is, 
He did not lift a single finger. He did not lay a single brick to erect this magnificent ivory white marble mausoleum. Yeah, he didn't touch a single brick to build this beautiful structure. So how can we say he built it? Well, simple reason is he authorized it, right? He authorized it and at the end of it, when it's done, we say he built it. So something similar. Talk about the originator. Okay, so we have uh, the idea of an architect or a designer. And an architect does not actually use his hands to build a cathedral or a structure, something beautiful or majestic, but he is recognized as its builder. See, he himself does not use his hands to do a single thing in building that, and yet he's called the builder. Why? This is because he is the brains. He is the intelligence. And down here, I say he is the designer behind what the building is supposed to look like. He sets down the design in the form of a blueprint. In other words, the architect takes a piece of paper and he draws out the exact measurements. The architect draws out the exact measurements of what he wants that building or that structure to look like. He gives very specific measurements. And so it becomes what we call a blueprint. And this blueprint is the instrument to guide whoever is going to build the actual structure. So the architect does not have to lay a single finger. All he needs to do is to be the intelligence or the brains behind that whole design of that building with the exact specifications. So in the same way, we see that God does not have to exactly use his hands to write the Bible, but he's still the originator, just like the architect is the originator of the design and the blueprint for the building. So God himself does not actually write the Bible books with his own hands, but he initiates the writing of the Bible books through the divine inspiration of his Holy Spirit, right? And just now we said the all scripture is God breathed. That means the Holy Spirit is the one that puts the words into the mind of the Bible writer. And behind it is the intelligence that is God himself. Just like the architect is the intelligence behind a building that we will ultimately see. So that's the originator. Now let's talk about the work done. Yes, an architect designs the blueprints. He is the brains, the intelligence behind how the whole thing should look like. Then he engages a team yeah, to build the structure of the house. And this team will use the blueprint as the instrument to guide them. Okay, so that will include the engineers, the contractors, the construction workers, and so on. It's a big team of people. And they will follow the blueprint and build exactly according to all the measurements and specifications. So similarly with the Bible, God also engages a team of people to write down the Holy Spirit's inspiration for each of the Bible books. So the same principle applies whether for architect with a building or God with a Bible, right? It is the intelligence behind directing the production. So what we have is the finished product from architect to the completed building. Similarly, from God to the Bible that we have. And that is how we have the divine origin possible that God is the author of the Bible. Now, 
Let's move on to the Bible repeatedly declares that it is inspired directly by God himself and that it is free from error. The Torah, Torah means uh, particularly the uh, first five books of the Old Testament, reveals that God actually wrote a portion of the scriptures. Uh, just now I said God did not even use his hands to write, but not 100% true because the Ten Commandments, God actually wrote the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone with his finger. Okay? And Moses recorded this event. So a certain small portion of the Bible is actually written by God himself with his finger. And is given in Exodus 31 verse 18, where would somebody like to read that for us? When the Lord, sorry, when the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount, Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony. The tablets of the stone is scrapped by the fingers of God. Exodus 31 verse 18. Thank you, Jacob. Right, so the finger of God, God himself did actually write a small portion of the Bible with his own finger. Centuries later, in the New Testament, the gospel writer Matthew wrote, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. This Matthew 5.18 NIV version, I give you the KJ, uh, King James version. For verily, this is Jesus talking, verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Now you notice I use colors. Huh? So the smallest letter is what KJV says, one jot. And what is one jot? One jot is the name of the smallest letter. For example, in Hebrew, it will be the letter called the yod. Okay, the letter called the yod. And you know what the yod looks like? It looks like a little comma, okay? The yod in Hebrew looks like a little comma, except that it is floating in the air, not on the line. It's floating in the air. So that is the smallest letter if you talk about Hebrew, a jot. Now, if you talk about Greek, you know our Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek, right? Hebrew for the Old Testament with a little bit of Aramaic and Greek in the New Testament. So the Greek smallest letter is an iota. What is an iota? It looks like a little tauge. You know what tauge is? A little eye. So it's a little eye straight down with a tiny little curly tail. Okay, that is a Greek iota, the smallest letter. And I don't think it has a dot on top of it. <laughs> okay, yeah. So not the smallest letter, one jot. Whether it's the Old Testament, yod, or the Greek, yota, not the least stroke of a pen. And the least stroke of a pen is the word called tittle. A tittle is the minute point or stroke added to some letters of the Hebrew alphabet to distinguish them from others which they resemble. Hence, the very least point. Uh, how can I use illustration? It will be like the dot on your letter J. Okay, the dot on your letter J. Or you know some languages that on top of the E, there's a little line. Yeah, on some, in some languages, there's a, the letter E with a little line on top of it, right? Okay, so a title is that. Either a dot or a little line. Okay, a little line or dot, that's a title. So one jot... Jesus is saying, not the smallest little alphabet, or uh, little letter, or the least stroke of a, just a dot or a, a dot or a comma, something like that, or a, a line on top of the letter E. Not any of these 
will by any means disappear from the Bible, the law, until the Bible is fulfilled. So that is saying something simply amazing because even dots, commas, and strokes are important in the Bible. This statement states that the very words and the spelling of words in the original Hebrew and Greek languages were inspired by God. God is the originator. And I highlighted the sentence, which is very inspiring. The discovery of the phenomenal Bible quotes. Some of you might have come across the Bible quotes in recent years, because there is something called computer. Computer makes Bible quotes discovery a lot faster okay, than previously. So the discovery of the phenomenal Bible quotes, I will give you an example later. So just stay with me for explanation here. In recent years, strongly supports that Jesus was telling the exact, precise truth when he declared that the exact spelling of the words found in the Bible was inspired by God thousands of years ago. Remember just now he said, uh, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall not pass away. Okay, so just a quick reminder, a jot is the smallest letter and a tittle is that little point or stroke, like a dot on top of the J or the stroke across the top of the E. And so here is an example, okay? Uh, an example in English, the Bible must be, uh, for the Bible, it is in the original language. Let me explain that later. But let's take this English illustration first, okay? Uh, this, this text uh, is actually from Genesis chapter 26, verse 5 to 10a. So if you want to follow along in your Genesis 26, 5 to 10a, but the English is a little bit archaic. That means the English here is very old, okay? So uh, the, the Bible quotes appears in the form of something called ELS. Follow my cursor. ELS means equidistant letter sequencing. Equidistant is the letter E, L for letter, S for sequencing. So it follows a, an ELS coding. What is ELS? Letters are selected based on a starting point. So you have to start somewhere. Start wherever you start. Then you count every nth letter. Every nth letter. So you, 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 you just search for, for example, every 50th letter. So you count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 until 50. You circle that letter. And then you count the next 50 from that letter. And then you circle that letter after 50. Then you count another 50 and you circle that 50. It's a little bit like what we did in math primary one. They have this pattern. I don't know whether you remember when you were in school, the teacher will give you this math, this simple math question like, okay, I give you a pattern, five, 10, 15, what's the next number? What's the next number? 20, right? So easy, you follow the pattern. If the teacher says, 10, 20, 30, 40, what's the next number? 50. Now let's make it a little bit more challenging. If the teacher says 7, 14, 21, 28, 35, what's the next letter? 42, oh, you're very good. So you can do ELS, okay? Equidistant letter sequencing. Every nth letter, just now I started with nth letter is five. So 5, 10, 15, 20. Then I started with 10. Every nth letter is 10. So 10, 20, 30, 40. Now I have every nth letter is seven, right? Seven letters. So I have seven, 14, 21, 28, 35, 42. Okay, so this is how it works with the Bible quotes. You have a starting point, for example, seven, and then you count every nth letter, which is a seven multiple in a skip number. So seven, skip to 14, skip to 21 in a given distance. Okay, so based on this passage in Genesis 26, 5 to 10a, uh, I don't know how it works out, but it actually works in English. Okay, 
So what we have is B I B L E. Can you see the circle red? B I B L E, and it's every nth letter. Okay, in this case, it's backwards from here to here, and then up to this B, and then up to this L, and up to this E. So it can go in any direction, all right? But it must follow an nth letter spacing. So you have Bible, and then you have this C O D E, spelling code. So I'm quite amazed that it actually works in English because the original should be working with original language. So just to convince you that this is not jump mumbo jumbo from anywhere, Genesis 26, five to 10 actually says, if you look there, this will be accurate, but not the English exactly. My statutes and my laws and Isaac dwelt in uh, Gerah and the men of the place asked him, of his wife, and he said, she is my sister, for he feared to say, she is my wife, lest said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines looked out, uh, looked out at a window and saw and behold, Isaac was spotting with Rebekah, his wife, and Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold of a surety, she is thy wife. And how said, how saidst Thou, she is my sister. And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you can see it is actually a story. I'm not producing rubbish. Okay, so the discovery of the Bible quotes in recent years strongly supports that Jesus was telling the exact truth when he declared that the exact spelling of the words in the Bible, that should be in Hebrew for the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament, was inspired by God thousands of years ago when he wrote it. So if people have changed, you know, just now we said, huh, if people change the writing, change the words, then this whole pattern will all be disrupted. So let's take a look at a real one. Huh? Okay, so now you see it's not English anymore. This is all the Hebrew letters. Okay, these are all Hebrew letters. Look like Tauge, right? Very weird to us with English. But you know, Barack Obama, he's, he can also be found. Oh, sorry. Barack Obama, he can also be found inside the Bible quotes. Uh, so somebody very nicely on the internet has given us Barack Obama, the name is in blue, so boxed up in blue. Now remember, this is Hebrew, huh? not English. Okay. And then purple, purple, this uh, Pentagon shape, president. So there you go, president. And then the black box, father, your father. And there's the Hebrew word here beside the English word for you to ref reference and check. Barak, uh, this six-sided pink shape. So there you have Barak. And then you have the red circle in the USA. So your red circle. And then Islamic, you have this, uh, looks like a brick shape. Okay, Islamic. So you have all these words to review Barack Obama in proximity to each other. So that's a Bible code example. Then you have another one. This is Donald Trump. Okay, so you have the green for Donald here. Then you have the dark blue for president. So dark blue, sorry, this thing is blocking the way. Uh, sorry, let me... Okay, 
dark blue up there. Sorry, it's blocked by the screen sharing thing. Then you have the light blue, US, United States. You have the purple, the year, the year he was born, 1946. You have the purple here. Then pink, you have uh, the month, June, that he was born in. And then yellow, the word affluent, he was rich. So you have yellow. And then the brown, financing, money, wealth. And there you go, the brown. Okay, so there you have Bible code referring to uh, Donald Trump. Then you have another one in history, Holocaust, okay? In our time, all peoples whose goal is to annihilate, destroy, eh? the Jewish people are considered to be the spiritual descendants of Amalek. You don't know what is, who, is, who or what is Amalek, that means you didn't read your Old Testament, but the, the point here is uh, Amalek is the considered, eh? Symbolic of all peoples whose goal is to annihilate or destroy the Jewish people. So the date 9th of Av is a date on which many tragedies occurred. With respect to the Holocaust, it was on the 9th of Av, July 23rd, 1942, that the first group of people from Warsaw were put into the cattle cows going to the death camp of Treblinka. Right, so here is just a little illustration of the Holocaust in the Bible codes. So we have in the Holocaust here, uh, didn't tell us what color, but you can spot it here. Okay, and this one, and then Amalek would be this one. Okay, this words, this letters here in Hebrew would be this one here. Oh, by the way, when you read Hebrew, it's not English style from left to right. You have to read it from right to left. So opposite direction, direction from English. Yeah, okay. Adolf Hitler is this one. So where do we have Adolf Hitler? Uh, this one here. Okay, this way, Adolf Hitler. And then the ninth of half would be this one. Exactly, you see, this letter is equivalent to the M. Okay, this letter equivalent to the B in English. So you have the ninth of Av. All right, so there you see the Holocaust is also embedded in the Bible quotes. Ah, here's another very interesting one. From Isaiah 53, verse eight to 10. Now Isaiah 53, eight to 10, you have the English version and here is KJV. And this is the Hebrew text. Okay, the Hebrew text with all the Tauge. Eh? Okay. So can somebody read for us the English? He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Okay, thank you. So this is King James Version, uh, a bit difficult to follow, but if you want to look at simpler modern translation, go ahead, okay? But as an illustration, Hebrew text does not change, eh? not like Hebrew, a lot of, uh, sorry, English has a lot of translations and paraphrases, but the Hebrew text remains unchanged, okay? So reading from right to left, from here to here, and then from here to here, Okay, you see the Bible code e, e, uh, equidistant letter sequencing. You have this, uh, this is the yod. Just now I was telling you the smallest letter in Hebrew is the yod. So it's this, this little letter here that looks like a, a comma, but in the air. Okay, a comma, but floating in the air. So when you do the uh, ELS, you actually have this, this, 
two words popping up, okay, from backwards from here, the yod, and then the equivalent of the letter S here, and you will spell Yeshua Shemim, Shemami, Shemi, Yeshua Shemi, and in English it means Jesus is my name. Okay, you, you, all of you, I think you are familiar with the name Yeshua, right? So this is the Hebrew spelling for Yeshua, Jesus, translated in English, and Jesus is my name. Remember, it's from right to left. Okay, so these two words in Hebrew, in English is Jesus is my name. And it's found in this particular passage of Isaiah 53 verses 8 to 10. You can see here, this is translated over here. Okay, and so this, he was taken from prison. He was cut off from the land of the living. He made his grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death. He had done no violence, no deceit in his mouth. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. And down here, it does not mention who is this he, but embedded in Bible quotes, it says, this he, Jesus, is my name. Isn't that amazing? Okay, when we read it in English, we don't see a name. This he seems to be mysterious. But when we discover the Bible quotes, we actually discover embedded in this passage that this he is, God has hidden this message to say, this he, Jesus is my name. Isn't that amazing? Right? So you see the Bible, if somebody had changed the Bible words, this whole pattern would all be disrupted. Okay? All this, Jesus is my name and just now Barack Obama and all, this, all the other things, they will never pop out. If people have changed okay so some people not convinced but the bible quotes actually is very amazing right so let's explore more but some people may think huh? the mere fact that the bible claims to be the word of god does not necessarily prove that it is such but with the combination of the bible quotes we have seen that it is truly amazing for because there are other scripture books of other religions that make similar claims. The difference is that the scriptures contain convincing evidence as being the word of God. So we're going to explore the unity and harmony of the Bible, okay, how it makes sense. When we investigate the evidence, we will find that the Bible writer's claims or divine inspiration stated over 3,000 times in various ways were amply justified and one major evidence is, is unity and harmony okay and that one we will explore uh, and continue next week okay so what we have seen for today is um, we said that the bible is the word of the creator god himself right? Uh, he put the words in the minds of the people that write the Bible books, and it is through his Holy Spirit that he puts all these words in their minds to write, and because they follow God's inspiration, right, they can produce the final product of the Bible that on the surface is up to us to believe, and then at the bottom of it, you can see that God has actually got another level of message, another level of truth. And so if some of you might recall, I've ever said something like this, that when the people who are supposed to copy the Bible, you know, they, have, they, have, they don't have photocopy machine. They don't have camera to take photographs. Right, So they have to very tediously copy the Bible in the original language, letter by letter, word by word. And to the people who do this copying, they're called scribes, they are told, you cannot change the word of God. That means you cannot edit the Bible if you think there's mistakes and you change the words in there. Because if you do, you destroy the fabric of the universe. Some of you might remember me saying this before you destroy the fabric of the universe. 
And this Bible quote, surprisingly and amazingly, is actually evidence of that. Because if we change the Bible words, see, the Bible quotes hidden under the surface has the information about all of us. So if you can find the Bible quotes software program, right, and use it, you can actually probably find your name somewhere in the Bible. Yeah, and information about you. Okay, so imagine if somebody were to change the Bible words, all the information will be disrupted, you would di disappear. That's why you destroy the fabric of the universe. Because, for example, Jesus is my name will no longer appear there. And all these names of Barack Obama, uh, Holocaust, and Donald Trump, all this would disappear because somebody changed the words. Okay, so you destroy the fabric of the universe if you change the Bible words, the original Hebrew and Greek words, original language. So once again, showing us very convincingly that the Bible is the word of God. Isn't that amazing? Right? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, God, for your word. And we thank you, God, that you are such an amazing God. You give us your word, the Bible, which on the surface gives us a message. And yet, at a deeper level, you have also embedded the Bible code to reveal all our existence, all our lives that we are not aware of. Information about us, about people like we know, like Donald Trump, Princess Diana, Hitler, and events, even like World War and uh, Holocaust and so on. All these are hidden in your Bible quotes beneath the surface of the Bible message. And we are amazed, God, that you are so truly profound and amazing and omniscient. And we pray, Lord, as we continue to study the, the subject of apologetics to show how you, have, how you have preserved your word accurately throughout time, Father Lord, and how you do it. We pray, God, that our faith will truly grow and we will be faithful to your message and what you desire for us. And we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.